and thank you everybody coming along and thanks LLS for inviting myself and my fellow compatriots down here who we, we all know each other fairly well. Um, we all live within about 100 kilometres of each other but in three very different um, environments where we are. So, um, I, Before I move on from this slide, there's actually a couple of people right at the front here that will see themselves in a couple of these slides. There's a couple of guys at the front here that did a tour with me a couple of years ago um, looking at regenerative farming in Victoria and, and it's one of the things that I love to do but um, due to COVID haven't done a lot of it lately. But part of um, what I love doing and it was great having Byron and the Beltree school guys come up to the farm is, is just sharing and um, talking to people about producing better food and healthier food. And I, and I love being in farming because no matter what happens in the world, everybody still has to eat. So we've got a business, we've got something to do. Um, so today I'm just going to set a bit of a scene on um, what, what some principles around regenerative farming and then I'll give you a little bit of insight into some of the things that we've seen in taking on a new property in the last few years and going through the drought and a few things like that. So I'll have a look at that. So we'll talk about the principles and, um, and a little bit of, of our journey. Um, and my slide has mucked up again, but anyway, I, I thought this definition by Charles Massey on regenerative agriculture is probably a really good one. That it's an ecological approach to farming that enables landscapes to renew themselves. And the two important things is enabling that renewal. Okay, so we are, and you know, we've got to be those enablers and look at ourselves in that way. So, and we've been doing that. We're working with nature. So it's just a change to start to work with nature rather than trying to beat it into submission to do what we want it to do a lot of the time. So regenerative agriculture can include a whole stack of practices. You'll come across stuff at field days and everything all the time and probably some stuff today that you know Tim and, and Stu and I are doing and you'll see different things but what it really comes down to is a set of principles and these are principles that I've sort of pulled together from a whole range of different people around the world that have tried to define regenerative agriculture you know that little definition of Charles Massey is quite broad but then how do you break that down so these are the um, sort of five overarching principles that, that I see from what people are doing around the world and, and what we apply in our farming business and what I teach. So the first is it's holistic and then we're connected to holes and it's all complex. So no matter what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, we affect other people and other things in the environment and that environment affects us and there's that complexity. So when we're talking about and thinking about how we do do things and whether we're going to decide, you know, like Byron said, go home and, and try something, we have to think about how that's going to affect um, those things around us and how those things outside us are affecting us. So it's, it's, that's where the holistic decision making process comes in to allow us to better make um, those decisions in taking into account people, environment and economics and I've actually changed economics to prosperity because it's more than just money. It includes money, but it's prosperity as well. So those decision makings around holistic is just us balancing that. So when we decide to do something, we go, okay, how's it going to affect my economics, my prosperity of, of my family and my community? How's it going to affect the environment and how's it going to affect the people um, themselves in a social point of view? And that's some of that mental health stuff that, we've been, that um, um, was just talked about. So we're aiming for a better outcome and what we want to do is balance these three things in our decision making. A lot of the decision making that has been in the past is very compartmentalised in different areas. And I even heard um, talking about the budget um, on the radio in the last two days in that, you know, they're talking about the environment and they said, well, you can't just put the environment, make decisions about, you know, saving koalas in Tasmania if you don't take into account the economics of the situation and, and the people involved with that as well. You know, and vice versa, we can look at inflation and make decisions about inflation, but how's that going to affect you know, the environment and the outcome of that? So we just need to have a look at a different way of making those decisions. And as you make them, just start to think about those things collectively. So the second one, abundance and resilience. And I love this term abundance because nature is abundant. It's, it's, it's not... 
It's not a poor thing. It's lots of stuff around. And when we start to look at, um, especially down to the microbe level, there's a huge amount of diversity and, and stuff happening all the time. So what we want to do with our businesses and our communities is mimic that. Think about that abundance and resilience and mimic those things in, in how natural systems. You know, a lot of our, our traditional systems, you know, government and all those sorts of things, are, you know, this whole hierarchical, very linear type thinking process. But as we saw, you know, it's holistic, it's complex, you know. So, and nature is like this, it's complex. So we need to actually think about our resilience and we're talking about drought resilience and just resilience in general. That complexity gives us some of that resilience because we're not reliant on one pathway or something. We're not producing one product that's then going to have the supply chain broken or we're not you know, having one input, you know, like urea nitrogen that's now highly expensive and can't afford to put it in. So we look at that complexity. And when we're making um, you know, decisions again around how we're going to structure our life and our business, we want to say, well, what, what would it look like in nature? You know, how can I make this more like a natural system? Part of that abundance is also looking at enterprises. And as Byron's talking about going and buying some sheep, all right, then we'll be onto the pigs and some chooks and the other stuff as well. So diversity of, of animal species, diversity of plant species, diversity of microbiology, you know, all that diversity, we want to look at how we actually create that in our system. So you know, we, we run um, what we call a FLIRD, you know, it's a flock and a herd together. We run our sheep and cattle together. Um, it's becoming more common, but as people specialise in either sheep or, or beef or, or wool and lamb, uh, then they might specialise. But what we find in doing that, we get um, benefits to both species and the pastures and the biology in that they'll eat different grasses and uh, the cattle can help look after worm burden for the sheep and vice, you know, things like that. So there's a whole range of, of benefits you get. Um, adding in uh, omnivores, chooks and pigs and things into the system, can add some other benefits into it. But there are also some complexities with adding omnivores into, into systems where we've got base around herbivore um, production. But again, we want to look at how we mimic natural systems. You know? So um, in nature, animals run together, they don't delineate themselves, they cross-pollinate cross and they go around and you know, cross over. You know, it's, there's a lot of this stuff. So we want to look at how that, and we want to look at what the natural um, synergies are between species. So, you know, as I said, sheep and cattle, there's some synergies there. When you add chooks in coming behind, for example, you know, they can take, take care of, of worm, um, fly, maggots and things like that. So you can find some synergies there that add in to the complexity of the system without actually, um, you know, the old adage of scarce resources, well in these cases that's not scarce. You can actually use the same resources and multiply it. The same diversity we want in our economic system. So one of the big things that you'll hear is around, you know, local food, local food, local food, which is fantastic, you know, and to be able to pr produce and eat locally is, is great. But there is also the need for us to be able to supply on a regional, a national, and even a global point of view. So I heard um, Hugh McKay talk about globalisation um, at a talk at the farm a few years ago, and he said, a global economy is not a bad thing. It's the distribution of scarce resources around the world. Globalisation is the problem because it's based on power and control. Okay, so when we're looking at developing economic systems, again, we want to look at what happens in nature and create economic systems that will mimic natural systems as well. So what, you know, birds migrate from continent to continent, you know, so things happen in, in nature that are beyond just the local area. So we can actually look at that as well. But that diversity of the economic system means that we're not just reliant on one, one local area. So we're all going to eat local, and then we have a drought in this area and no one can produce the market gardens, then what happens then? And we have to sell our sheep and our cattle off because we can't feed them, then we have a problem. So this is where this diversity of, of the economic system comes into it as well. And I, while we're here on economics, it's an important part of regenerative agriculture is that it is economically profitable, is that we have to base our decisions you know, on those three things about economics. We've got to say, is this going to make good money. Can I be prosperous and resilient into the future doing what I'm doing? Okay. 
The foundation is developing healthy soil, okay, because we're growing plants, those plants have to be in healthy soil. So we want to look at what's the effect of our practices and things on that. So how are we going to affect it, what's going to happen to that soil. Now, you can look these up on the web, this isn't mine, this is um, out of the US, and these are the six principles of soil health. A lot of people are putting this up, I think, um, one of the food companies out of the US puts this up as their principles of regenerative agriculture, but they miss some of that other stuff we've been talking about. But if we look at these principles of soil health and then how we're going to apply it in our system, these give you some practical things on a day-to-day -day basis you can start to work on to say, okay, well, what am I going to do in keeping living roots in the soil? Okay, And I'll show you some examples from, from what we've been doing in a second on that. By changing our focus around that soil, we look at then developing the biology to improve our fertility. We look at that diversity below the soil and we start to learn about the interactions of soil biology with our plants. And it's something we don't see a lot of. It was something that I didn't get taught other than rhizobial bacteria with a legume. It was the only thing in agronomy I got taught at university. That was the only biology. And I think a lot of universities are still haven't gone very far beyond that. But we're now starting, you know, Elaine Ingham came out to Australia with RCS in um, early 2000s and was talking about the soil food web. And then we went on and, and she was talking about fungal balance and fungal dominance. Now we've gone on to look at things like the Johnson Sioux fungal dominated compost and the interaction of fungi with the roots. Um, John Kempf, in a presentation at the last RCS conference just in July, was talking about research in the US about plants and their interaction with bacteria and that they suck bacteria in through the, through the root tip, tear the sheath off the outside so they can get to the nutrients inside, then go, yep, I want that nutrient, send it up to, to the cell, cell absorbs it, takes nutrients. Anything that doesn't need, it spits it back out the root hair, puts the coating back on the outside with chemical signals to tell it to go and find certain nutrients that it might need. So this interaction that we're just starting to learn about, and it's, but it's, it just shows that complexity. But we don't need to necessarily know the intricacies of that, but just think about what we're doing and how we might affect that negatively or positively in what we make decisions we're making. And, and the things that we manage on a day-to-day -day basis are these four ecosystem processes. So you, know, we, you would have all, you know, water cycle and mineral cycle, very common. Everybody's talking about minerals and water and, and droughts and floods and things at the moment. Um, energy flow is highly important because that's the thing that everything's based on. We've got to capture that, that sunlight, that energy coming in from the sun every day. And um, one of the guys from Maloon Institute the other day, I can't think of exactly the statistic it was, about the percentage of sunlight that's actually captured by photosynthesising plants on a daily basis. And it's less than 1 or 2% of the total energy that comes into the earth is captured by photosynthesis. Our job is to maximise that to then be able to convert it into food directly by plants or by, by grazing animals and animals. So it's highly important that we understand how we do that. And the community dynamics, again, I keep talking about this diversity, this dynamics. It's, it's the dynamics of our communities, age structures, um, different you know, all those things around prosperity that we're talking about with th that community dynamics. But these are the drivers of our profitability and our regeneration. Now, if you go home tomorrow, and as far as this being a, you know, a definition of regenerative agriculture, what, if you go tomorrow and decide that I'm going to make a positive influence on any one of those things, you're regenerative. You're regenerating. You're starting to improve the system. So regenerative agriculture is not a destination. It's not, I'm going to be certified organic and here I am. It's, I'm making decisions today to make a change that's going to improve the water that's on my farm, that's going to improve the food that I'm producing, it's going to produce, you know, look after the soil biology, you're going to have more diverse plants. As soon as you start doing that, you're, you, you're, you're there, you're on the way. And that's, you, you just look at continuing that journey. Looking back at that prosperity, the other thing is that it looks at the whole food system. So when we're looking at um, building, and this is probably one of the big areas where there's still a lot of roadblocks, is creating circular economies. You know, food goes off the farm, 
waste comes back on. I think Cole Masters talks about, you know, in nature, the poop of one thing is the food of something else, okay? And all of our production systems to this point have been very linear, especially in the last, you know, 50 to 100 years, very linear. Everything goes off the farm and everything we bring back on is synthetically or, you know, products produced some way. So we need to have a look at how we can actually look and create these loops of feedback, you know, and get things back. So how do we bring waste products back? How do we do those sort of things? Now, I was in um, New York, uh, actually about 10 years ago with a tour group, and there's a market right in the centre of New York, and all of the food and produce in this market in New York comes from the Hudson Valley and the New York State, within about 200 kilometres of the city. And part of them building this feedback loop is that everybody who buys food from that, that market can actually bring back their waste, their, their food scraps and things, to a stall that then takes it and produces compost that goes back to the producers that are producing the food. So they've actually created a feedback, of, you know, this loop back in that system. And that's in the middle of New York. So if they can do that in the middle of New York, we should be able to do something. So, yeah. And importantly, it's reconnecting us with our food. Um, I think that's one thing, and, and I heard on a podcast this morning as I was driving down, is that we've lost that connection. You know, we, we've been told to produce commodities, and in producing commodities, we've lost connection with the consumer, the consumer's lost connection with how that, that stuff's produced. And I thought it was great that Byron, that Byron said, your decisions when you go and buy food is then telling people how to produce food. So if you want it produced differently, then you need to make different decisions. And reconnecting with that food is amazing. And this, this gentleman over here is Richard Maycomb, who's um, a mentor of mine and probably many others. He's um, uh, used to run properties up in the um, Gulf country of North Australia. Um, <clears throat> has been doing regenerative farming for many, many, many years. In fact, they did some carbon trials on their grazing properties with rotational and, and cell grazing up in the um, Gulf country there. And his property performed so well in the research that they discounted it as an outlier and said, well, that's too far out, we can't count that. You know, so they took his data out of the data set rather than saying, what's he doing <laughs> that we need to do? Yeah. So he, he actually retired back to the New England and bought a property and started producing compost and, um, and now he's sold that place on and he's now got a small place called Barley Fields where just out of Armidale where they used to grow wheat and barley for the flour mills that were in town. And they couldn't grow it anymore because the, the country just got ripped to pieces. And he's regenerating that, that country. He's building it back, putting in multi-species um, pasture crops, um, broadcasting it out. He's still using um, composts and compost extracts and various things to do that. And, and he, he and his wife came to the US with me 10 years ago, and that's him in New York City looking at an apple from Hudson Valley. So, so, so I love that photo of, of Richard. <laughs> so, yeah. And this particular one here, this is actually um, a free-range pig in California, um, just north of San Francisco, where they, they're running them out with the cattle in, over there in that area, and they're rotating them around just in, in large grazing areas. So with people and community, we want partnerships of individuals within the food system. And Amanda is going to talk about some stuff that she's doing, um, which is fantastic, and you can find these partnerships all around the place. Um, I'm speaking in a couple of weeks' time at um, the Black Gully Festival in Armidale, and I've got myself and a couple of other food producers from the local area talking about our local food production. And one of those is the um, Orchard, the Yeoman's Orchard um, at Arding, who have been there for oh, 80, long time. Yeah, second or third generation at least. And they're now chasing heritage varieties, they're chasing wild varieties of apples, they're starting to produce their own ciders and things on there that are distributed locally within, within the region. Now I've convinced Tom to talk, which took a bit of convincing, but he's going to have a, have a chat about what they're doing. But it's, it's us trying to reconnect. Um, we've got our beef and land product that we only produce um, for a regional market and we're just trying to get people reconnected in those communities with those food groups. And it's strengthening, as in, it's strengthening the culture in agriculture. You know, it's that connection, it's that you know, people knowing. And that's why it was great having bell trees up with the kids and going, this is, this is what 
what it looks like and I've got photos of them. And I, I use, what I do with the kids when they come to the farm is I get them to actually go o'clock across the paddocks and I want them to collect as many species of plants as they can find as they go across the paddocks because it gets them down looking at stuff that they don't normally look at and starts to get them learning about diversity and, and that abundance within, within nature. So, that's sort of the principles, to sort of lay the groundwork. Now those principles when you start, you know, when Stu and, and, and Tim talk, you'll see that hopefully run through what we're talking. This is my wife and I and our place at uh, Wallamombi. And I'll just go through a bit of our story with this property. So my background, um, as um, Byron said, my parents did a grazing for profit school in about 1993, it was probably one of the, f you know, well they'd started only about three or four years before that, they were in one of the first executive link groups. And that influenced me and my career and I was doing ag economics at Armadale Uni and I went, well I want to be a consultant because I, my dad was only, um, he's only 20 years older than me and that time he was actively running the farm. And I wanted to work for RCS. Now it took me four years and eventually I did work for RCS for a few years and I've done various things over the years since then but still had a huge passion for farming and, and, um, and what was not termed regenerative agriculture and I think the US tour I took was the sustainable farming tour back then. Um, and I remember having discussions at that time with Darren Doherty about the term regenerative um, 10 years ago and where it was going and who had control of it and all those sort of things and we're still having those discussions now. But uh, um, four years ago, my wife and I um, had the opportunity, um, got ourselves in a financial position that we could purchase um, this um, block. Um, the hills in the background there is Ack Hill Station. Um, it's a corporate sort of multi-owned um, business. Charlie Coventry, who's one of the partners there, went to uni with me. He was at uni at the same time as I was. They've got about um, 5,000 hectares, I think, something like that. We're 65 hectares on this particular property. Other, other neighbour is Wallamombi Station and I think they've got about 12,000 hectares. <laughs> so we're a little, little pinprick next to them. But we have really great relationships with our neighbours. And in fact, down along the creek, just in that bottom down there, we've got a shared paddock with Charlie and I, which is a year about grazing paddock to solve a problem on one of the rivers down there. So um, our little farm is uh, Taranore Farm. Uh, we... For the last few years, we've been buying in and growing out um, uh, wieners and young lambs and doing a direct sale product um, to a local and regional um, market. So we do boxed beef and lamb and, and then we've been selling the excess into the markets and doing that. Um, this year, we've now taken on the lease of um, our family farm. My parents and now got to the stage where the dad's going, yep, I don't want to do this much anymore. I want to be able to go and fly and play golf and do those things. Um, so we've taken on that and it's, it's um, about 2,000 hectares. So it's a much bigger, bigger place. So we're now expanding our operation and looking at other avenues of marketing our products to butchers and various things. Um, this is just a view of our place. This is the Chandler River, um, which at this stage um, looks pretty placid, but in the last six months <laughs> has, has flooded from about that tree um, here right out to this fence here at a, a number of times. Um, we, can, we usually be able to graze that in during the winter because there's a good chance it won't flood during the winter, it will with storms in the summer. This year that wasn't the case, <laughs> it wasn't the case. Um, we kicked off our operation on this property. Um, we bought in some uh, cows and calves <coughs> from my brother-in-law. That was some cull cows that he had. And we went, right, that kicks us off. We get going, we had 26 cows and I think we had another 10 wieners that we bought in. And we started working on fences and water. Um, the property had, and I'll show you a picture of the, of the, the uh, paddocks in a second. Um, it had seven paddocks on the place and the whole of that river, um, this was all unfenced. So none of the river was fenced and that was just one huge paddock. And actually Charlie and Ack Hill, um, I, probably once every two years, they'd send a couple of hundred head of cattle over there for a week and just graze it out and then they'd disappear again. So that was the only way they could actually graze that section. So we, we set about to, um, to put in some fences and we got some funding. This is along that riparian, that fencing. We got some funding from LLS 
to actually fence off the riparian zone so that we could control the grazing in and out of that and that allowed us to split up so that's the edge of the river right there and we're putting a f that fence in so we sort of went where we thought was the high, f high tide mark, <laughs> a couple of places it sort of punches through. Um, and uh, looking, and most of the water on the place, or all the water on the place at the time, was just dams. And you'll see the state of some of those in a second. But what we saw in an old aerial, um, aerial photograph was a line in, from about 10 years ago. And so I asked a neighbour, because it seemed to be go towards his house, and they said, oh, yeah, there was a pipeline there. So we actually found a pipe that went from the river all the way to the top of the property. So we went and found the tops and bottoms and started putting troughs and getting into that. Um, we then uh, headed in, we bought the property in May, headed into our first winter. There was a good bulk of feed on the property. It had been a pretty good season um, the summer before. I think we'd gone to up to a rolling rainfall of about 900 millimetres. Our annual average is 800. So we'd had a good bulk of feed. And when we bought the place, they didn't have a lot of stock on it. So um, we felt fairly confident. Um, just to give you a sort of an idea of the environs, um, that would be the frost on the back of our cows in the middle of winter. Um, temperature is our limiting factor in some of this in winter. Okay, So um, even though it's a dry period of the year for us, if we're looking after our pastures, we actually usually have enough soil moisture, but we just don't have the you know, temperature to be able to grow some of the grasses. So um, I think this particular frost was something like a minus eight and I think I lost like five or six taps that just cracked open. So um, a bit of work after that. So this is July 2018 in the middle of uh, winter. Um, we've still got uh, st some standing dry feed. These cattle are moving out of this paddock and um, we were still getting rainfall. And then in October we got, um, we got a, a spring break. Now I've got some photos here that are of a similar area and I've marked here these two trees just so you've got a reference um, to see where, where it all sits together. So this was at the top of our property. Um, we put in a little monitoring spot here so we could monitor the recovery of our grass as we started into spring. Um, and we went, yep, happy days, everything's cruising along. Um, and then it wasn't. We hit the drought. That was November 2019. So if I go back to this October 2018, by December that year, we had realised our rainfall was dropping off. Our grazing charts, we weren't, didn't have enough, enough feed left in the paddocks. We could see that our spring hadn't come. And so we started destocking. Um, we had those cows and calves on the ground and we destocked to a point where we knew that we could carry those cows and calves through until February when we could actually sell them and, and early, either early wean or sell them as cow-calf units. So we had to get them through to there. So we destocked everything else. And then in February, we then destocked all the cattle. And we had a little mob of lambs that we'd bought on for a couple of months after that. And then, then we were destocked completely after that. So by the end of November of 2019, and this is looking across, and you can that's um, the uh, topsoil and organic matter blowing off the hills there. Um, even if you kept ground cover, just the desiccation and the wind just was just blowing stuff away. Okay, so we went from you know that 900 millimeters sort of the, the six months before we bought the property. Um, by December of uh, 2019, we were down to 275 mils rolling rainfall. Then in January, it rained, and within the first two weeks, we had grass growing. Um, in our paddocks, and we had our neighbours calling us saying, "Can we adjust your cat? Can we put a cattle on your place?" Because <laughs> they they didn't have anything, and they hadn't destocked, so they were still feeding the paddocks and and those sorts of things. They wanted to get them off. Um, so, just stepping back, so this is December twenty December nineteen. So on the top of that hill, even though that view across the paddock there looked really desolate. When we looked at our paddocks, where we had got a little bit of rainfall, we were getting some grass growth. We had ground cover. So that when it did rain, we got growth. And it came in pretty quick. And then it came in really quick. So that was February, a month later. And we'd only just bought stock at that stage. I sort of got to the end of January going, oh, do I buy? I don't know whether it's going to continue. I'll, you know. And then I went, okay, at this stage, I went, 
okay, let's do a pasture check. So I actually calculated how much feed we had standing in the paddocks at that time and worked out that if it stopped raining then, I could carry, I think it was about 40 head for 365 days if nothing else grew. Okay? So I could confidently go and buy stock. I did that assessment in the paddock. And so we bought, we bought in stock and we started growing. And since, since then, it hasn't stopped raining. <laughs> um, so September 2020, so we're through to the next spring. You can see we've come through winter and unlike that first winter where we were pretty much getting down to stuff, we've got a lot of standing feed coming out of that, into that spring. And January 21, um, what is predominant in that paddock now is, so if we just go back, I'll just show you here. So what's predominant in that paddock there is paddock lovegrass. Um, I can't think of the Latin name for it. Tim might. Curve. Yeah, so paddock lovegrass. So it's a, it's a good, it's a good um, perennial um, summer growing um, grass for us. And it's a... Aragostus, yeah. So um, we quite like it. And one of the great things about it is if, if you can keep a bulk of it during the summer, um, some of that residual, it gives a really good buffer to the temperatures at, at soil level as we go into winter. So we actually keep green stuff growing underneath it during winter. And it sort of haze off. When we got to the next year, it was Canadian fleabane. Canadian fleabane as far as I can see. Yeah, we were hosing the truck out every time we left the place because it was, it was just seed everywhere. In the New England, I'm not sure whether it was down here, the first year came out of the drought and castor oil plant grew like nothing else across the whole area, okay? Castor oil plant needs formaldehyde to, form, to cause the seed to germinate. So it needs anaerobic decomposition of stuff. So when we got all that really, really wet rain with stuff, decomposed stuff and anaerobic produced formaldehyde, castor oil plant grew. Next year, no castor oil plant but we've got Canadian fleabane. The following year, we've had, and I was having a talk with um, Nicola yesterday about this, we got the purple top vivina. This year, and I just saw it as we come through, we're getting um, milk thistle, and then he, around here you're getting saffron thistles and things like that, which is leaching of sulphur and things. So we get this transition of plants, but they're telling us something. So we're looking at it going, okay, well, what's the flea bane? That's not what I want. Sheep love it, actually. They, they'll eat it. It's great. Really good tannins in it. Keeps the worm burden down. Fantastic stuff. But it also is opening up those compacted soils after the drought. October 22, this is, I went and took this yesterday, and that's the same paddock. And now we've got a species change, and we've got some clover coming through, we've got microlina, we've got plume grass, we've got coxfoot, we've got fescue, you know, we've got all these sort of things. We haven't put any of that seed in at all. That's just been sitting there waiting for the conditions to come. So through our grazing, changing our grazing, giving recovery, um, we're able to actually get some of those things to come back and regenerate back into our pastures. Okay, so destocking and keeping ground cover during the drought and allowing that to recover before we put stock onto it back in when that drought broke. Um, and then giving recovery, sufficient recovery for those plants to regrow and restore their energy every time we graze them. So this is similar place on, on the property. So that's what it looked like in October 2018 when we took over. And this, that's what it looks like now. So four years including one year of drought where we destocked. So change can happen pretty quickly, you know. And there's a few things we've, we've done in some areas. In this particular area, we haven't done anything other than grazing management, you know, and just looking after those plants. So this is, as in, this is the rainfall, just because the, there's a difference in rainfall between these two. But what I wanted to see is the species composition change. This has got a lot more here because... This is where we are at the moment, of 1,342 millimetres of rain, and that one was at 666 or 700 mils of rain. So still good, you know, not bad rainfall in 2018 when we took over. And you can see it had been up around 966 in the February before that. <coughs> so bulk is probably due to the amount of rain, but the species mix is the thing that's changed for us over that period of time. So a couple of things that we've been doing, back to the principles. 
creating a living root in the ground all the time. So when we first took over in winter, you saw that those paddocks had virtually nothing growing in the winter because the way that the pastures had been grazed before we took over, the stock were in there in paddocks for long periods of time over winter. So every time a winter active grass chucked up and said, I'm going to grow, a cow came along and took it out. And eventually they just they'll disappear, they die out. So to start with, we went, okay, we want to get some living roots back in there. And so we broadcast out oats into this paddock. And you can see this is the paddock love grass. I think that's, um, that's probably a bit of plume grass there. You can see there's some wild turnip and things there. But what these oats gave us was living roots during winter. So we could look after that biology through, those, um, through the, the, the dry part. Now also this cover gave us better soil temperature. So when you measure in a frosty morning like those cows are sitting on top of the hill, the difference between the temperature at the top of that grass and the ground is about four or five degrees difference. So it's a lot warmer. So grasses, and I, and I think in our, one of the years there, I could go through and still find paspalum growing in the middle of winter underneath this cover. Okay. But the oats were put in as living 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 roots and it was a bit of a trial. We've been trialling a few different things and trying to find um, low cost um, seeds that we can put out that will grow just by broadcasting them because I don't have equipment. Um, I think I'd love to borrow Stu's pasture renovator, aerator thing that he's uh, got. Um, there's a guy in Dorigo who builds this thing that helps put them in um, and it just sort of punches the soil, opens up leaf and drops the seed in which would be great. But I've got no equipment, so I want to be able to broadcast it out really cheap. And, I, and this seed costs, costs me about a buck a kilo or two bucks a kilo. You know, cheap stuff. Like, cheap as I can get. So uh, grazing oats, just oh, it's just whatever oats. I think that was Wallaroo oats or something, I think, one. And it went okay. The next year it didn't go really well. This year we've tried Kuba. The reason we tried Kuba this year is because all the guys in the wheat country hate it because it's self-seeds. And I go, that's what I want. <laughs> I want that. Um, so the other thing we did with this particular paddock <coughs> is um, after this had happened, when we come into the spring, we sprayed out some Johnson Sioux fungal dominant compost. And I set up my little spray rig. I had a um, IBC shuttle with a spray on it. And I went, yep, I'm spraying this paddock. Really good. Twelve months later, we walk across the paddock going, there's a bit of a stripe here. So I stuck the drone up and what I didn't realise is that my spray rig wasn't going as far as I thought it was, which was in, a, in effect a really good trial because you can see here, and hopefully the guys out the back, you can come and have a look at it later, there are strips of green where I sprayed the biology out and added to it. It took 12 to 18 months before we saw that effect and what's happened in these areas is this is where the coxfoot and the fescue and now the prairie grass and things has come back. And then as that's developed, even now, another two years on, these strips in between go to seed before the strips where I put the stuff. They stay vegetative longer than where it hadn't been sprayed. It's slowly evening out. And I'm adding a bit more spray now to sort of catch all the gaps. But it was a really great little f failure that was a really good learning example to see what was happening. <coughs> And yeah, so again, that, that's where the oats was, was in that section. Um, cost me a couple of bucks. Well, it was probably $50 worth of oats in a hectare. And then the Johnson Sioux compost cost me my time and stuff. So let's say about 80 bucks worth of compost extract. So for $100, I've got a complete change. Now, I took my father-in-law out, who was a very um, traditional farmer. And he walked across, he said, oh, when did you sow this? I went, well, they didn't sow anything. It was all that seed was sitting there waiting for the conditions to be right. So many times people will go out and go, right, I want to put in a, I want to put a new pasture in. So they'll plough the paddock up and they'll add stuff to it and they'll put the pasture in. And it won't succeed because we haven't changed the conditions to allow it. Um, I can't think of who it was was talking the other day saying that um, fertility with the plant is a, is a process of osmosis. And so if you put a high fertility plant in a low fertility soil, the soil will suck the, suck the fertility out of the plant. So if you're putting in high performance ryegrass into poor, grass, poor soils, it's not going to perform. You put in lower fertility plants 
into that, then you've got a benefit. So what we're trying to do is build soil over time to be able to do that. Use the diversity was there. Use the Canadian flea bone. Use the thistles. You know, all those sorts of things are helping build that soil and I've all got different interactions in the soil. So it's a <coughs> Johnson Sioux compost is a um, David Johnson from the US created a static pile composting process that takes about 12 months where the outcome of it is a fungal dominated vermicast compost. We take that and about two kilos per hectare extract it out with water in diluted into about 500 litres and, sp and spray that out on the paddock with some molasses and milk and stuff added in for food for the biology as well. So the idea is that over a 12 month period <coughs> by using highly lignin based materials in the compost you produce more fungi than bacteria. So the traditional composting method of turning compost all the time produces compost that is just highly bacterial. Okay, this, because it's static and it uses high lignin material, produces a compost which is fungal dominated and by leaving it for 12 months, those fungi then use all the food and then create spores for you then to extract out and spray out under the paddocks to be able to get that fungi to then start working out in the paddocks and start that reaction. Because what has happened in a lot of soils that we've been managing is because of our management practices, especially pasture renovation and even you know compaction with animals and things, we've killed off a lot of the fungal um, activity that was in our soils. And that's one of the key pathways for plants to get nutrition back into their root systems. I'm happy to have a talk with anybody afterwards if they want some more information. Yep. Oh, sorry, uh, did you have any uh, novel troubles when you were doing this on your farm? Yep. <laughs> I've, I've used all sorts of nozzles and the last one I'm using is actually just a garden hose you know just your general garden spray put on so it's a big fan and and it works really well there are some you can buy but they're, they're like you know 80 90 dollars for a nozzle and I'm not going to spend that much on a nozzle I've got a biodynamic one which is just a brass cap um, end cap with with um, two mil holes drilled in it it's not too bad. It just depends on how you can sieve it as well out as, uh, too. Like if you had one of those sieves like out there, the fire pit, I'd love one of those so I could sieve my compost. But yeah, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Rod. If I look after it, it should be permanent, yeah. Yeah. Because we're building, our focus is in building that soil biology and then doing everything we can to maintain that. So we're maintaining perennial plants with deep roots. We're maintaining green material all year. Like we've had, we've had good rain the last couple of years, which has been really fortunate, but we've taken advantage of that. But our aim is to have um, species that are growing all through the year. So one of the things with energy, energy flow is to be able to capture sunlight all the time. So we want winter active and summer active grass plants growing. I'll say plants because we want diversity. So we're putting, the only perennials that we've planted or added to our broadcast mix have been chicory and plantain and red clover. Um, chicory and plantain more for their medicinal action, but we've also picked a plantain that is are active all year round so we can get some herbage during winter as well so yeah so um, the other other thing we tried was um, millet um, and in fact this is just bird seed bag of bird seed from the hard west I think it costs a dollar 75 a kilo you can buy a 25 kilo bag of finch mix for about 35 bucks Right. And we broadcast it out and this is December 19, so this was just as we were starting to get um, some rain at the end of that drought uh, period. And you can see on the back end of this, that's haze, that's smoke haze from all the bushfires that went through Stu's place, unfortunately. Um, but it went into bare ground and it was like this paddock, this particular paddock is the yard around the shed and the guy we bought it off had some mobility issues and the only thing he could do was sit in his lawnmower. And so this paddock was effectively overgrazed constantly for five years. And all that was in it was flatweed and just, just rubbish. There was no grass really growing in it at all. 
So in part of us trying to sort of do a bit of an experiment, I went, okay, well, let's just chuck some bird seed out there. It had about, the great thing about the Finch mix is it's got about four different types of millet in it. Um, and it's got some um, panicum and it's got some canary seed, which is um, phalaris, and it's got a bit of canola and other bits and pieces in it. So that's December. Then we got the rain a little bit before Christmas, and then we got January, got the rain. By March, she was like that. And I put the cattle in it over the heads, and it was just, it was fantastic. Subsequent year, broadcast the millet out into grass and didn't work. It's a complete failure. But it cost me like 50 bucks. So I went, okay, well, that doesn't work. I'll try something else. So I'm trying to find seeds that I can broadcast out. And I think breeding of a lot of these seeds has meant that they're not, that they need to be planted because of the way we've bred them. So it's trying to find those ones that work. Um, at the moment, we're trying, this year, we're trying sugar drip, sorghum, um, some sunflowers, lupins, buckwheat. Um, what else is in there? Red clover works, it works really well. Um, uh, the sugar rips coming up, sunflowers are fantastic. I've got little sunnies coming up in the paddocks at the moment. Wherever we have feed spots where we put the cattle, the feed trough, the mineral trough, we just spread seed around it so it re recolonizes the bare ground. And um, yeah, we've got little sunflowers waiting for the ground to warm up now. So there's, there's a red clover, there's our lambs in a little paddock that we'd. And this is, this is plume grass here, this, this grass here. We didn't see it until last year. I think we had a few little patches of it. Last year, it's just come up everywhere, and it's a beautiful native grass. Um, it's got a really soft, flowing plume on it. The seeds are really soft; they don't get in the wool and things like that. It's you know, and a, uh, it's a late winter, early spring um, grain grass, which is um, fantastic. So, yeah, and we're we're now we're actually going to be harvesting that this year for the tree group. So we're actually making some income off of getting that seed for the tree group. So yeah. So just to give you an idea, so when we bought the property and those guys outside probably won't be able to see this, but you can have a look at it later. Um, these are the fences. We had one, two, three, four, five, six, and the river. That's all we had. We now have 33 paddocks. Um, they're arranged from one to four hectares. Um, at the moment, we're... We're giving extended recovery to this part of the property. Traditionally, this line down the middle was two places that got divided. So the, the management between the two tides for 100 years has been different. So at the moment, this side, we're on about a 45-day recovery period, and this, we're on about a 90 to 120-day recovery. So we'll cycle around this twice and then go through that over this summer period. Um, and then during winter, we then push right out to do one grazing in 200 days on each of these paddocks. So to do that, we have to adjust our stock and various other things. So, All right. Is there any other questions? I can't see any questions from outside. Can you just hold your questions to the panel, guys? Oh, okay. I'm just going to keep rolling on, thanks. No worries. All right. Um, and just to finish off, this, that we've, as I said, we've got our, our beef and lamb box business. Um, and uh, there's some of our lovely grasses we, we had for Christmas last year. So we had kangaroo grass and plume grass and wild sorghum and all sorts of stuff that um, that's our market store for Christmas in Armada. We only do one market. Um, most of our customers um, are subscription customers now. And, and for the last two months, I've been putting sold out on our page because we can't get enough supply at the moment. Um, we're, that's the purpose of buying, having the other property and get building that up. But um, we do about uh, 25 to 30 boxes, um, 10 kilo boxes each month. Um, and of that, about two thirds of our customers are subscription customers. And um, probably half of those subscription customers have been with us since the first year. We've been, this is our third year, and they've been with us for the, since that first year. And I think. If you think of the lifetime value of someone buying from you, I think I looked at the value, I think one of our first customers has now spent $9,000 with us in three years. So when you think about marketing and getting a customer, it's pretty worth spending a few hundred bucks to get $9,000 worth of turnover, isn't it? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and when, when we first started, my wife, I, and even I, went, we don't want to do markets. I, I just I couldn't. I'd, I'd done tours and I'd seen guys doing it and everything else, but I actually really enjoy it. We only go to one now. We go to Armadale Market 
and it's actually really enjoyable. We have really great conversations with people. Um, we never get any discussion about price. Um, and we have things here, here like we're talking about um, what we're doing on the farm. You know, so 5,000 litres of compost extract put out, 1,000 trees planted, you know, what we're doing. So we're prompting people to talk to us about it. So for us, it's about that bit of education as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's a bit odd. Yeah. <laughs> well, we won't let's stack of it. Let's try. Absolutely. Yep. So, so we the just. Reinforcing the business being grass fed and they're taking home at four bucks a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> on top of the chop. Cost me nothing to grow. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thank you. And we'll have some questions a bit later. I'll hand you back to Byron. Yeah.